Hello YouTube, Patrick here and this is my channel 1984. Today I have a CPU here, it's an Atron XP, it's nothing special really. It's a 2500 plus model and the reason why I'm making a video on this is because like I said it's nothing special but it's still slightly special. It's uh, most likely an unlocked version. The thing with these CPUs is that they were made for quite some time. Like even when Opter on an Atlas 64 was out in 2003, these things were made into 2004. <coughs> and I do have a fair few Atlas XPs, but most of them are locked and they're past. They're like made in 2004, so. And that means a few things, like I said, unlocked after usually week 38, year 2003. And this seems to be a week 34 and 2003, so it should be unlocked. Also later, what they did was they completely cut the L1 bridge, which is over here. As you can set the multiplier, so people couldn't reconnect the bridge to unlock them. So even if you have like a like a ship that doesn't have the bridges cut from say 2004, it's most likely the bridge is most likely not even connected internally. So that's why I got a little bit excited when I got this ship. So this being unlocked is quite nice. Also, these 2500 plus they are basically the same CPU as the 3200 plus. It's the same ship. Same internal multiplier. The difference is that this thing is supposed to run at uh, 333 megahertz bus and the 3200 plus is supposed to run at 400. So what was quite common with these ships were that if you bought a system with this ship, it's like an icing on the cake if you bought it from the you know the local store. They would offer to overclock it to 3200 plus just by increasing the bus, and they were quite well known to reliably run it. 3200 plus speeds, which is something like 2.23 gigahertz, I think, and this is 1.83 gigahertz. So, so this is kind of like a very popular overclocking ship back in the day, quite cheap. It has the maximum amount of L2 cache of 512k. So, yeah. That's why I'm making a video on this because I want to replace my 3000 plus which is basically the same as this one but this one is locked and a slight loan multiplier and it runs at a 400 megahertz bus. There are also 3000 pluses with 333 megahertz bus. So thing is I do have RAM capable of 500 megahertz and I have an Enforce 2 board, not a fancy one at all. So. That's probably going to be the bottleneck, but uh, right now with the 3000 plus I'm running into you know, core instability at around 425 megahertz bus, I think it is, or 2.23 gigahertz, it basically is a 3200 plus now, so very small overclock and it doesn't, that, that ship doesn't like to go any higher on the core, it just, uh, if you cool it very well you can go a little bit higher, but uh, yeah. So I hope this is a, as good if not better overclock up. Plus with the multiplier being unlocked I can increase the bus probably at around 450 I'm hoping. So my Enforce 2 board isn't the best, it's a budget board. So I have no clue what that is actually capable of. But uh, with 500 meter RAM and this ship we could find out how far we can go I figure. So the next thing to do is to get uh, the system where this is supposed to go into. So this is the system we're gonna upgrade, or well, downgrade and hopefully upgrade as a result. It's a modern case, I don't actually remember the name now. I see a fair few people use this case. It's a fractal, I think. Quite cheap, but, and the sheet metal is quite thin, but it's still, uh, the way they have folded it and pressed it and so on, it's quite sturdy still. So, it reminds me a bit of the Shift Trade Dragon was actually what I wanted to find, but I couldn't find one for like a year and then when I bought this thing everyone suddenly had one. So that's what it is, a, fr a fractal case with a window side, so got some LEDs and stuff. And it has a custom uh, made uh, 
like PSU cover at the bottom I made to, because this is a Chief Take 360 watt under there was quite period correct for an Atalon or Atalon XP to the 5 amps on the 5 volt rail and the motherboard is a Astrock Enforce 2 400 Ultra I think it's the ships it is this is the basically the last one so it's dual channel memory which isn't that useful for the CPU by itself but uh, you could have an IGP on those boards where it actually help if you used IGP that would actually boost the performance quite a lot on that so a good board like this could pr probably do I read that Nvidia had like binned ships and boards for their own use that went to 500 megahertz I got this up to around 430 something but I, my CPU can't go any further stable at all so that's why we're switching the CPU out and the RAM is 500 megahertz DDR we test I think they're called um, uh, yeah so the memory should be fine I actually got those pretty cheap and the graphics card is a 5900 Ultra a GeForce FX 5900 Ultra from Asus basically a reference board with a custom cooler and the reference board is blue making it look more non-reference than it actually is so yeah that is the basic system the CPU cooler is a custom that I made from a 775 cooler from a quarter duo so it's got a custom bracket for socket A a couple of fractal fans so it's a little bit of a pita to remove and add but it has a copper base and two heat pipes which actually makes it perform quite well that's one reason I picked it and it's compact enough that it fits most socket A boards and it still can handle like a high end socket A CPU at pretty decent overclock so. So we're gonna take this uh, CPU out and put that one in. So this is the CPU cooler, <coughs> like I said, copper base, two copper heat pipes, some custom made 2mm bracket for socket A, that's where the socket 775 uh, brackets were going before, out of some HP OEM system I think. So here we have the old CPU, it's a 3000 plus like I said, 2.1 GHz and there is the 2500 plus, 1.83 GHz, so that's 400 bus, 333 MHz bus. So you're gonna change the jumpers on the motherboard too, it needs to be set to the same as the standard, the default bus for the CPU, but we can then change it in the BIOS to whatever we want. And here is the RAM, 500 MHz DDR. 512 MB sticks, so those are DDR, not DDR2 or anything else. So, I like 100 MB above official the JDX official standard of 400 is the highest as far as I know.
So here we are, and we have a 2500 plus, 1833 megahertz. So you can see the CPU here and the amount of RAM, 1 gig, running at 200 megahertz, DDR400, so that's 400 effective. So I suppose it's what I need to do next is I actually want to lower the multiplier to see if we can get it to run like say 1.5 gigahertz because we want to try out how, how we can take the bus and memory before we increase the core clock, so to speak. So that's the next thing to do. So here we have the feed jumpers, and that's how we're going to set the multiplier. And we have an 1833 MHz CPU with an actual free bus frequency of 166 MHz. Uh, that's double data rate, so that's 363. So we need to use the 166 number and divide by divide 1833 by 166 and we get 11, so that's our default multiplier. So I want to lower it to say something that gives us uh, maybe 1.5 or something. So if we take multiply, you can make it run as multiplier 8, that would give us in, in, in theory a 250 megahertz bus, a 2 gigahertz core clock, which is an, still an overclock, but the ship should be fine, and I don't think we we'll get that high on FSB anyway. So you set it to 8 now. Now that would give us on 166 bus 1328 megahertz, so like 1.33 gigahertz. So we need to get some jumpers and uh, set them according to this table for multiplier 8. So the feed jumpers were obviously located under the CPU fan uh, down here. Uh, three rows of five. So I removed the case fan so I hopefully can get to them. the jumpers and the nice thing was that the multi 8 had the same order in reverse so it doesn't matter which which is the first jumper which is the last feed jumper 0 or feed jumper 4 so the only thing left to do is to mount the case fan again and try and the thing is with unlocked CPUs, the CPUs of this era is that unlike modern processors like a K-series Intel CPU is that overclocking with the multiplier doesn't always work it depends on motherboard implementation and it depends on motherboard implementation and stuff like that so even if the CPU is unlocked we're not guaranteed for this to work so all of this might have been for nothing but there's sadly only one way to find out and that is to try Uh, so now that we have switched out the CPU, I have uh, experimented with uh, the front side bus memory. And instead of boring you with like 20 attempts to uh, get something to post and uh, run mem test, I figured out that the max frequency on the bus can, I could post was 245, but that was quite difficult and very random. 240 was posting half the times. So I got into Mentest once, but it's, uh, it didn't get any memory errors. It just doesn't post when you reboot and things like that. So 235 seems to post when reboot all the time. Uh, uh, yeah. I've been experimenting with timings. This is the tightest I got to post. Cast 3, they are rated at Cast 3, 8, 4, 4, but that is at 500 megahertz. So with 235 bus, that means 470 megahertz actual bus and memory. And the memory is set to 166 megahertz, it's DDR, so 333. That's because the CPU is a 333 megahertz bus CPU. So that's a 1 1 ratio, so when the bus runs is 470 or uh, 235, depending on the count. The memory does the same thing, so it's not like most modern motherboards that will tell you the actual frequency. This is actually not the frequency, it's the ratio. So when you're overclocking on these old systems, you have to take into account that the frequency given is not correct. It's, it's the ratio. So the ratio I want is 1-1, one, one, 
and that I get by setting the CPU and bus, uh, the CPU's bus and memory to the same clock. So since this board is configured for 330 megabit bus on the actual board, set the memory to that too. So you will see later when we run mem test that uh, the bus and memory is running at the same frequency in a one one. So this is what I got to post. Uh, reliably for the stable mem test we'll show. We'll run that later. I have been uh, running mem test here for just over an hour. We have two passes and the reason I run two passes is because the first one is faster than the second one. So the second one is more more thorough. And if you have a hard to find memory error it usually shows up on the second pass. And since we have done both the first and the second it seems that for a 7 MHz bus and memory at 3, 4, 4, 8 timings is stable. We could probably try to push it a bit more. But uh, at least we have something that is stable now. 470 MHz is not bad at all. It's the highest I've ever run a, a socket A system bus and memory at. So, pretty happy with that. I have overclocked the CPU, it says 2247 MHz and I did try 2360 I think it was that post uh, you get into BIOS but it freezes like a minute in or so so it's highly unstable and that is on the max V core I could pin what the CPU to get the lot more V core but well I don't feel like burning it out so when I, have a very, I can't really tune the voltage then it's all, basically all or nothing and uh, I think with these particular models with the, this record it says the, the pin mod, the, the step up is quite high so I don't want to do that so we're gonna have to prime 95 test this and a 3200 plus CPU would run at 2200 MHz so we're already slightly above that obviously we can run uh, we did run mem test and uh, we found out the memory and bus is, seems to be stable. We don't know for sure, but A AGP and PCI they running PCI is running at 38.7 and AGP is running like 77 or something, 77 and a half like, megahertz. So we will try to post it to Windows now and see if we can actually run some Prime 95. Assuming we don't get the Prime 95 crash very early. I'm gonna let it run for 24 hours. I find it to be the most reliable. And so says the author of it. So and I need to find a program. You can run some CPUC here just to check some stuff. Uh, if you notice some flickering, I think one of my lamps are dying. Oh, let's see here we have. Uh, I lowered the resolution a bit so it's easy to see. I don't have a capture card unfortunately. So the device was lying a little bit here. We got 2332.47 MHz. So that's a really nice number. Uh, let's see here. The bus speed is 235. Yep. Yeah. Rated at speed 269.96. So close enough. 512 kilobytes of cache, L2. Voltage is just shy of 1.7. It's a part on core. Caches. Yeah. So you can see it's an MFOS 2 Ultra 400. Memory 235 MHz. So that's uh, the frequency. So it's 470 actual frequency. And you can see FSP DRAM 1 to 1. So the ratio that I talked about before in the bias. Running 3, 3, 3, 7 timings. Here we can also see. What is rated for? So it's rated for 1250 MHz, 3448 and 25447. So actually below even at 2 MHz. Like load times are better, so even at 200 MHz, if we had, had ran 4 MHz, so 200 MHz frequency would, would still be overclocking the timings, so to speak. So that's pretty nice. We can run such tight timings. And yeah, we're not going to benchmark here. So let's run a uh, torture test here, and I will 
turn the camera off because I did his face now or his face at any point within the next 24 hours. So it's, just, it's a waiting game now. But if this is stable and very golden, then we can do some benchmarking. I think they have some old scores here we could look at and compare to. But this isn't really about comparing it to before and now. Uh, if we hit this frequency stable, it's the same as the old CPU, but we're gonna be up, I think, up uh, about 40, 38 megahertz or something on the bus, I think. So, when I just shut off the camera, it uh, failed Prime 95 at 2.23 gigahertz at 470 megahertz bus. Obviously, with some super weird error I've never seen. Some out, uh, something called some out or something like that. I'll put some, but it was stuck in a loop. Usually, Prime and Fan just stops executing and you know, holds on an error. So, I tried lower the multiply. We're running nine and a half, so I tried nine, but that doesn't post. It posts in fail safe and tells you that the overclocking failed. And if you're going to BIOS, then it says nine times 166, so 1500 megahertz. So the, the multiplier works as long as you're in fail-safe BIOS, basically, which is kind of annoying. So it can read the multiplier, just can't use it with the, when it actually loads the proper BIOS settings. So what I had to do was lower the bus from 470 to 466.7. So I lowered 2 MHz, which equates to about 4. This might still not be stable. Uh, I'd have to go a bit lower. But... Uh, yeah, we're running at 2.216 2260 MHz right now. I have been uh, running some Prime 95 and uh, I can't get it stable at 1.7 ish volts at 2185 MHz. So we have basically two options either downclock it even more to like 455 MHz bus or do the jump and mod to 1.85 volts or find a, a v-core mod for the motherboard which I think I have found after registering on our webpage where I found a mod from 2020 and the reason I wanted to check on that mod was because there is a mod for a similar motherboard to this one but it has a, a different v, VRM con, PVM controller for the voltage it's, the last digit is not the same but comparing the mods for both motherboards are basically the same. And the reason I had to compare that way is because the data sheet for this particular uh, PVM controller for the V core it doesn't seem to be available anywhere anymore. So, with that in mind, I think we should uh, do the motherboard V core mod, which allows us to set pretty much any V core we want. So, to uh, get some more V core so we can actually get the CPU up to where we want it so we can get the most out of the bus we need to make a voltage mod for motherboard and that involves basically uh, making a shortcut for the voltage regulator to ground uh, using a couple of resistors you could use just a fixed one, gives you the VQ you want, and so solder it to the voltage controller between the ground and the, I think it's called FB pin in the data sheet. I, I want mine to be variable. Uh, I'm not exactly sure on the values we need. The guide from my board said uh, 4.7 for the fixed one and uh, 10 for the variable potentiometer. The reason you want a fixed one is you can't go too low. It said 4.7 on this particular board. Someone had made a guide, maybe just a screenshot of it. Uh, at 4.7 plus 10, I picked an 8 because I looked at another board very similar, a similar VRM, same pin out, and they used uh, 10 kilo ohms. This is 8 kilo ohms. I used 10 in total and that gave plus 250 millivolts, this is way too much. So I figured like a safer bet would be maybe going with 8 here and 
instead of 4.7 as my board called for. That might be correct, but uh, I'm not looking to overvolt a lot, which a lot of these guides do. I want a, a smaller overvolt, a reasonable one for air cooling. So, and for the put, I picked a 20 kilo ohm one because I didn't have a 10 one. The only difference that makes is that uh, the minimum overvolt will be higher, so the voltage difference will be smaller. And so we have to make more turns before we actually get uh, any real difference. And then the difference will increase a little bit faster. So every turn in, on a 20 kilo ohm compared to a 10 kilo ohm will have reduced the resistor by half. Relatively speaking, so there shouldn't be a problem. I used 25 on another of my motherboards, not the same thing. And to make this a little bit easier to mount on a motherboard, I usually use a free header somewhere. So I have this little thing made up, it will fit. Uh, I think it's a USB header or something that's very close to, to the voltage controller, so we can solder this to this board. Nothing will be actually connected to this, it's just to hold it. Then we can build everything else up here. I also made one that they cut one of these two size. Uh, so we can have a jumper to disconnect the mod if we don't want to use it. I've done the same thing on another board and that has worked out fine. So we start by adding this here so we can actually so we know where this goes. So let's put that in there. Should really get one of those holders for my stuff. I mostly do recaps and stuff, so I don't have one of those small holders for small things, I just bigger things. But anyways, this is what it is. So once we mounted this, uh, we're gonna add a couple of cables to this, so we can hook the two cables up to the voltage controller. So we can trick it. So I have to figure out the layout here. On this one here, I don't know if you can see, see marked a line here, which ones I want to use because I want the voltage to increase when I turn it clockwise, which means the resistance will go down. So I measure that, make sure that's correct. So I figured uh, edit with this line that way because that way is the voltage control too. So the cables come from there, and we make a row in between here. I think also to the header I just mounted, so we clear of that properly. So I won't need this outer pin here, only the, the middle one and the, that one. I'll snip this off because there is a circuit underneath. It's uh, no, no real problem shorting, just interfering. So, things will let me cut the size. So yeah, now we can later turn turn this to set the V current, whatever we want. Now we have to figure out where to put uh, everything else. The amper may be there and then the resistor next to it and we can pull out the cable somewhere around here maybe. Maybe we should just do 
that, I don't know. I don't think that that's fine. If you put it in the right way though. So my order list is to get something to hold small stuff like this. Hmm. Anyways, and then we need a resistor here. If I give it, try to use the try to use the uh, legs here to connect it to the potentiometer. So I need to get to the center leg on this one, I think. The easiest. So this goes in series. So it's a total of 28 kilo ohms. And we can go all the way down to 8. I should think should be fine. If it's not, we have to replace this uh, fixed one. You can also add a second one next to it if you stack one if that. Works out best. So now we need to make sure this is connected to this also. Probably use a piece of this to do that. Maybe you need cables anyway, so you can use the cables. Cables. So I don't know if you can see this, but uh, I pulled them up from the bottom here and uh, down again. That's because if you tighten this the slightest, uh, you might rip them off here. So this stuff is stress relief because it locks them in like a belt. So I did it on my other one, it's worked out quite well, I no, had no problems with it. So I'm just gonna solder that in place, first one <laughs> so 
so it should be it. Obviously in a jumper so we can test it out and we don't have any continuity. Because we want to make sure now that this is set to maximum resistance of 28 and then we can go down from there. Once we install it, I'm gonna try it out. So this end we need to open up a bit so we can try it out. out there so you can hook these up over here and we're out of line because I have no jumper and this is 28 which is fine and then we can turn this let's see Counter. Yeah, I'll also turn home obviously. Because we want to increase the V core, which means lower resistance. So increasing V core now theoretically if we're hooked up to the computer. We should drop out at 8. These are, I think, 25, 20 to 25 turns, something like that for a full. Uh, from min to max resistance, so let's see here. Yeah, 8.0. So now we have to go all the way back up again. Because we want to install it with uh, minimum, minimum effect on the V core. And there's the stop. So, it seems to be working. So let's do is install it. So we're gonna install the Volt mod. First we have the module here. And over here. It goes like that. And the jumper is out for now. Then I'm gonna solder those wires. On the 6 and 8 pin over here on this side here. I don't know if you can see when I solder it's gonna be a bit tight. Ideally I would like to have the motherboard out for this, but I didn't plan on doing this and getting the motherboard out of the system is a pita, as they say, so you probably couldn't see that, so I'm probably gonna cut that out because my head is in the way. But sometimes that's just the way it is. Ah, here we have it. It's not the most beautiful solder job in the world, but uh, it should do. I took a close-up picture and uh, because I don't have a microscope and it looks fine. No shorts, no nothing. I use Amtex Flux uh, to make sure it really... Uh, we don't have a problem with some oxidization and Amtex Flux is uh, non-conductive so any residue is no problem. And it was just a very tiny like microscopic drop on each. So I would like to tack this cable down now so it doesn't rip when I install the CPU coder or something like that. So, we're back now with the computer power on. I have uh, set the bus to 200 and uh, voltage to auto, so we're on base 165 volts, which in the BIOS reports right now 1661, 16, yeah, around 1677 is what you usually see. So, uh, and I have the medical red jumper here, so we're gonna push that in, and you can observe the V core if it changes anything. Jumper is in properly, and I see a change already. One seven five eight seven. Okay. So that's like uh, seven to seventy millivolts over stop now. 
And that is at 28,000 kilo ohms. And the guide I found from last year was for 4.7 plus 10, so almost 15k. So I don't know what that would have done, but I'm pretty glad I went with an 8k plus a 20k now, right now. I would probably have gone for a 10k plus a 25k maybe even, if I know. But uh, yeah. I can always review the module, but uh, this is a fine. This is fine since you, you're only using a mod to overvolt when overclock anyway, so you kind of want a small bump initially. And anyway. I usually try to aim for 50 millivolts over. Uh, so yeah, let's see if it actually we can change it something higher. Let's, for, let's try. Uh, I'm gonna turn this. Gonna. It might take some time before you see a change with all the 25 turns we can do. So I'm turning slow there. So far I can't see any change here. There seems to be a small change now, I saw 7.7. 7. Seven seven four. Let's see, you can get one point eight two, one point seven nine, two nine. This mod which is seems very flaky of this V core. How stable it is. I'm gonna measure it with a multimeter later, and it is one point eight, I think. Yeah, so there we have one eight, right on one point eight. There's a five volt. Let's see, there's one seven six. One seven six, one seven seven. So, so, so my motherboard reports are a little bit higher than my multimeter. Who is right? I don't know. But I cannot trust my multimeter back more. So what I'm gonna do at hand is uh, turn it down just a few turns so we get something close to that to like 1.775 I think. That, that should be 125 millivolts over stock. Turning counterclockwise here now. I'm gonna measure that with my multimeter. 1.75 so I'm pretty happy with that. So I'm gonna use that as a start to try and see if I can run 470 megahertz bus, which would give me 2.23 gigahertz, I think. If that isn't fully stable, I'll probably just increase the V quite a bit. Uh, also, the reason why we will not try and multiply nine because we're at nine and a half now. I tried nine and I figured out that it can post on it, but not over 440 megahertz bus, which is weird. Because it's a low multiplier, so it can't be like a CPU core frequency issue. It gets stuck on a postcode every time. It's super weird. It, like set up to 220, it seems to post fine, but uh, we want our a 220 frequency, so 440, but we want as close to our 470 we can get. So, with that said, I'm gonna reboot into Windows. I'm gonna set the so the, obviously set the bus and everything now, uh, and then boot into Windows and run some Prime 95. And if that, when I get something that works, I'm gonna film it so we can see the actual results on our like long and RAM, and uh, we can verify that this is stable. So we are back again here, and I've been running Prime 95. As you can see, it's still running here. It's been roughly 24 hours. So it's time to halt it and uh, see how long it ran. Stop. 23 hours to the 5 minutes. So apparently I started later than I remember, but uh, close enough. So that will have to do. As you can see, we're running at 2233 MHz, 9.5 multiplier. 235 megahertz bus, which is effectively 470, since we double data rate. So, MEM test has passed, Prime has passed, so we're basically good on stability as far as we can tell.
So here you can see the north bridge. And the spacing in between here is quite big, but these uh, fins are quite easy to bend. So to make a screw actually grab onto something, probably have to bend, bend some fins inwards, tighten them up a bit. And the fan I found was uh, Ada fan, which I added a nice short cable to. So actually over here, when I recapped the board, added some new caps. Well, all our caps are replaced. I actually added this Northbridge header here. So it's passive cooled originally. They didn't install that. So my plan is to remove the extra CPU fan from there and connect it to an adapter somewhere else because there's no more headers on the actual board. Well, only two to begin with. And, uh, to begin with, and I added a third one. So the plan was to put the fan like so, and uh, to make these grab. I figure we could bend these inwards a bit, like so. No one's really gonna see it for the fan later. These things quite easily get bent as it is. I figured if we do like that. And then connect the fan up. Like so. <coughs> yeah, that's grabbing. It's not like it's grabbing a lot, but it's not like it's a heavy item. Just enough. Yeah. So it's still pretty, pretty good now. This fan has a few hours on it, but it it seems fine, and it's a decent quality other fan, so I'm not too worried. So with the Northbridge sorted, I figured I would add a heatsink here to the Southbridge. Cut it out. I cut that out from a dead passive cool graphics card. Some really crappy graphics card I got for free. That was completely toast. It had killed itself by shorting itself out. So from overheating, passively cooled. Funny enough. So I figured I could use double-sided tape. I do have thermal double-sided tape, but I don't really trust that. And uh, so the alternative is. Well, AC glue and ter thermal compound in the middle, or epoxy. Epoxy isn't a good thermal conductor, quite the opposite. But uh, thermal tape isn't particularly good either, so it's like crap or crap. So, the thing with epoxy, downside is you can't remove it once you put it there. The uh, upside it is that it usually doesn't fall off ever again. So there's no risk of falling off and shorting something, maybe. So I think my plan is just to put some... Uh, Epoxy on there permanently. It looks like it should fit there. I mean, I cut it to size to fit the outlines. There's, there's no holes to mount uh, like a bit push pins. I have those, but like I said, there's no holes for it, as you can see. But uh, I think that will be fine uh, with that orientation. The front fan here is gonna help cool that thing. Like, you didn't want to touch that before, I can say that much. So Epoxy, it is. It is. Oh, I'm just gonna wipe this off with some alcohol, just in case there's some grease or something. Something coming up. So the epoxy really sticks. I'm gonna put the epoxy on the heat sink instead, it doesn't really matter. So I don't have to come in with the epoxy over the motherboard and stuff and get it all over. The epoxy has been applied. Push it down until the epoxy is thin as possible. Just because, like I said, it's not a very good heat conductor. So. Yeah, I think that's centered. With the overclocking and stability testing out of the way, we can look at some uh, benchmarks. I have uh, this old score here with the Atlon XP3000 Plus running at the 
2,233 megahertz, roughly. At 425 megahertz bus in memory. And that yield a score of 17,121 in 3 March 2000. So here is the score with the 2500 plus CPU running at 470 MHz bus and the same 2233 MHz core frequency and we're at, we're at 17,582 so big up over 400 points and you can look at the memory score here which is what gained those points. We're at about 3.3 gigabyte per second, and if I recall out of the box, this system does like 3 gigabyte per second uh, with the memory at 400 megahertz, maybe a little bit less. So that's a pretty nice uh, memory bandwidth for a socket A Atlon XP system. So here we are now with a stable overclock at 2.23 GHz and for a 170 MHz bus and memory. And what I'd like to do now is play some Mario Tournament 2004. We have a server we host and we have a Discord server too. So yeah, let's go over the settings here. And let the room. settings. Running 1600 or 1200 per cubic color, everything at max. So we're gonna join the server here. So open IP and then the brain, brain, land, sites.net, colon 7787. And connect to the server. people on my head, someone has a negative thing. So let's go ahead, this is onslaught, so we're gonna take nodes until we get to the node close, until we're node taken close to the enemy. And we can take the base node and win the game. So I'm gonna head down here and we're out. Here's our first node. Second one on the construction down here is a fight going on, obviously. The cool thing with this game mode is like it's a different like the first person shooter and like uh, I don't know what to call it, but the the beaters and stuff, so but they're not fast, they have a good detail, but the fact is something taking out the node. I'm gonna take out the node here so we can get one node close to them. Stop catching that node. I'm gonna chance of looking dead anyway. anyway. Is there a node over there something?
Yeah. 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 Discord server. I will link it in the description below, so you can join us and you can play with us on our servers. So thank you for watching and have a nice day.